Uh, we'll see how our ride height is. Just kind of took a guess in the dark, so let's find out. Oh shit. Coilovers. It's like buying a new, better set of legs for your car. I don't think there's anything out there that can improve your car's handling, looks, and just your general smiles per gallon as much as a new good set of coilovers. Today, I'm gonna go over what coilovers actually are and how they work, all the vocab associated with them, how to pick the right ones. I'll show you how to install them on the Miata, and then we'll take them for a test drive. I'm Zach, this is Money Pit, let's do it. So the job of the suspension of a car is to absorb bumps and potholes and make driving comfortable. The problem is that auto manufacturers usually make cars too comfortable and cars end up being really squishy and soft. Take a look at all the body roll on the Miata. On the stock soft suspension, the forces of the weight of the vehicle in the corner just squash the outside suspension, allowing the inside suspension to stand up. So this week we're going to replace that suspension with these coilovers. But before we do that, we need to understand what a coilover really is and how it works. So let's talk about it. There are two major components here, a coil spring over a shock absorber. First, let's look at the spring. This is a coil spring or a big old piece of steel wrapped up uh, in coils. So it looks like this or like this or like this or like this or like that. And its job is to store energy so that when it's compressed, it always wants to return to its original shape. That's why your car always returns to the same ride height after hitting potholes or speed bumps or whatever the hell the kids are hitting on the streets these days. Let's forget about the spring for a minute and just look at the shock absorber. It's kind of really the hero of the whole setup here because it's responsible for absorbing and damping all the shocks, bumps and potholes, etc. So what do we mean when we say damping? Well, what we really mean is slowing down the natural motion of spring oscillation or up and down bouncing. So using this little spring, if I just push it down and immediately move my hand, it just kind of jumps. But if I push it down, and dampen its return to normal, it's very controlled because I've controlled it. So that's kind of what your shock absorber is doing. I know you've seen a car with a blown shock absorber on the street. Wow. What? That's what it looks like. That is a shock absorber not doing anything and just letting your spring oscillate. So how does your shocks do it, huh? Well, it's called hydraulic resistance, baby, and it's really pretty simple. In here, there are a couple of chambers. There's a hydraulic fluid chamber, there's a high pressure gas chamber. They're separated by a floating piston. And then at the end of this rod is a piston which lives in that hydraulic fluid. So that piston is forced up and down with bumps in the road, which forces that hydraulic fluid that it lives in through tiny little holes or orifices in that piston. And that's what dampens oscillations, thanks to the resistance of the hydraulic fluid to flowing through those tiny holes. The bigger the bump, the harder the fluid is pushed and the more hydraulic resistance and heat we get. But what about that gas chamber, huh? Why is that there? It doesn't sound necessary. Well, it kind of is. Many shock absorbers also contain high pressure nitrogen gas to keep pressure on the hydraulic fluid. And that's important because of something called cavitation, which doesn't have anything to do with your dentist. Cavitation is when the hydraulic fluid begins to foam up due to repeated rapid shocks. And then once the fluid foams up or cavitates, the shock is rendered completely ineffective. Think of it this way. You have a can of soda, you shake it up, Nothing happens because while it's still closed, it's under pressure, so it's not foaming up. It only foams up when you remove the pressure by opening it. And that's basically what's going on inside a high pressure gas shock. You're shaking the hell out of it, but thanks to that pressure, it stays unfoamy and super effective. Uh, okay, so this is a ch setup change. Uh, I think so. All right, so now that we've got a basic understanding of what's going on in there, let's get back to talking about coilovers. Let's do a little vocab lesson. Threaded body, adjustable damping, pillow ball, ride height, external reservoir, spring rate, compression, rebound. What does any of that mean? Fear not, it's just car parts, baby. So let's break it down, talk about some of the different parts and features that you'll come across on the hunt for a set of coilovers for yourself. Pretty much all performance-oriented coilovers are gonna have a threaded body, which means what it says. The body of the coilover is threaded. So that allows you to adjust the height of the lower mounting bracketry, which in turn adjusts the ride height of the car. So the threaded body also generally allows coilovers to use a threaded spring perch, which separates ride height adjustment and the spring seat, which I think needs some explaining. You see, on some coilovers, you adjust the ride height by adjusting the spring perch, which if you're lowering the car, 
you'd end up with your spring perch really low, which would mean the spring would be all slack and rattly when the suspension is unloaded. So separating ride height and spring preload means that you can keep your spring nice and snug and do whatever you want with ride height. And it helps keep the pistons travel in its intended spot inside the shock body. So uh, it's really nice to have a set with separated ride height and spring perches. All right, so some coilovers offer adjustable damping, and we already talked about damping earlier, so we already know what that is, right? Well, sort of. There are two types of damping. There's compression and there's rebound. Rebound damping is damping as the suspension extends back to its normal position. Compression damping is the exact opposite. It's damping as the suspension compresses or as you're hitting a bump. So these two types of damping are adjustable by changing the hydraulic resistance, by changing the size of the orifices that the hydraulic fluid is forced through on that piston inside there. So you can't see the holes in the piston because they're inside, but what you can see is how you adjust them. It's usually just a little clicky boy like this, like that. So this has 12 clicks of adjustment from soft to firm. Uh, usually on most coilovers like this one, the rebound and compression damping are tied together, but on some of the higher end stuff, you get separate adjustability. So you can tune your, your uh, rebound and uh, compression damping as you see fit. Got it? Okay. So. That was a lot to take in. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, roll back a little bit. Now let's talk about the springs. So let's start with the spring rate, basically how stiff your spring is. Empirically speaking, or in American units, uh, if you have a spring with a rate of 100 pounds per inch, that means that if you put 100 pounds on top of that spring, it will compress one inch. For reference there, the Miata springs are eight kilograms per millimeter in the front and six kilograms per millimeter in the rear. This is a front eight kilograms per millimeter. So that is pretty basic and pretty easy, but that's only if we're talking about linear springs like this one, this is a linear spring. However, there are springs that change how much they compress depending on how much weight they already have on them. These are what's known as progressive springs. This means that the more a progressive spring compresses, the more it resists compressing further. The closer coils compress first, and then you get to the stiffer coils. The softer coils will absorb shocks and bumps, while the stiffer coils give you good handling characteristics. Sometimes they'll also be shaped like a cone too, where the diameter also changes. Speaking of different types of coils, sometimes you'll see a second spring altogether on a coilover, like this, and that spring is not for doing anything while you're driving. That's just what's called a helper spring. They're just in there to hold the springs in the right place when the suspension is unloaded, okay? So I think that's about it for springs for now. So then let's talk about our mounts, our upper mounts or our top hats. Uh, it's basically the bridge between your suspension and your car. So here we've got our nice uh, aluminum mounts with rubber in here. So the rubber mounts will absorb a lot of road noise and some vibration to keep the cabin pretty quiet and pretty comfortable. Some will have what's called a pillow ball mount. They are a spherical bearing, which means they're metal on metal. Very crisp, very responsive, nothing like a pillow. Not all coilovers will actually come with top hats or mounts. So in that case, you can reuse your stock ones if you want to, if they're in good shape. On some coilovers, you'll get camber plates or you can add them later. They're basically just top hats that give you some graduated slots so that you can slide your whole coilover in and out to adjust your camber. But on the Miata, they're kind of useless because we've got a double wishbone suspension, which means that the angle of the coilover really doesn't make much of a difference. So some shock absorbers will have an external reservoir. Why, you may ask? The reservoir generally relocates that high pressure gas chamber that we talked about earlier, which means now the entire shock body is full of fluid, which battles cavitation even better than just having that high pressure pocket in there. It also adds for a little longer travel range in the same shock body, and the added fluid that the reservoir adds also adds a little greater heat capacity to the whole system so your shock can handle more heat before it fades, so that's good too. So now that we know what coilovers are and how they work, how do you know which ones to pick for your car? Yo, check, check. Do not scratch or cause, surf or cause sufis defects to the damper shaft. Contains pressurized gas and oil. Do not puncture. So the more features a coilover has from the list of features we were just talking about, the more expensive they're gonna be, generally speaking. You know, if you're looking for really good handling, durability, longevity, customer support that you can actually call and get something done with, you should go with a coilover kind of in this mid-range category, in my opinion. Around a thousand to 15 or 1600 bucks for most platforms. And of course you can spend more, knock yourself out. Honestly, nice suspension is, as far as car parts go, money pretty well spent. But if all you wanna do is go lower, you can also go the avenue of lowering springs. These days, 
it can be a good option, especially for some of the fancy cars out there that have like electronic uh, damping control and stuff like that. There is a, a time and a place for lowering springs, I think, but it's not this. So I know there's probably a few of you out there waiting for me to say it. So there is also air suspension. There is some air suspension out there that handles pretty damn well. Uh, in my opinion, it's never gonna be quite as good as a good coilover and they're just always prone to leaks and issues. Okay, so all that said, these are what we picked, which the picking is probably the hardest part because there are just so many options. You have option paralysis. And because installing them is typically pretty easy. It's probably gonna take you like two to four hours, depending. It's always nice to have a helping hand, have a buddy around. You shouldn't need too many tools, some wrenches, some sockets, a jack and jack stands. That's about it. Let's do this. Wash your hands. All right, so the first thing you gotta do when you're gonna put new stuff in is take the old stuff out. So that's what we're gonna do. It's really easy in theory. Uh, there's just two bolt or two nuts at the top, one big bolt at the bottom. We also need to disconnect our sway bar end link. Our stock stuff is so long that I think it's gonna be a little bit of a battle to get it out of the suspension. Saron, help! Get in here. It's so close. We got glue. Alternatively, you can take out the upper control arms, which makes this a lot easier. It's a boy! <laughs> All right, well, the front came out super easy, so I'm expecting more of the same on the rear. We got two nuts on the top inside the trunk here, so we had to remove a little interior stuff and then uh, disconnect the sway bar, pop out the big bolt at the bottom of the uh, stock suspension, should come right out. Pretty easy. Now it's time to put in the new ones. First, I want to talk about that height difference. I don't know what ride height ultimately we're going to want to sit at. So I'm going to match them all up, make them all this size, then install them, and then we'll adjust ride height to our taste. They go in a lot easier than they came out. So the torque spec for the lower bolt here is uh, 54 to 69 foot pounds. So 69 it is, boys. All right, so uh, when you're tightening any rubber bushings in your suspension, it's important to do that at ride height or else they'll kind of always be bound up because you tightened them when the suspension was drooped and then you twist them up as you go to ride height. So uh, when you're tightening rubber stuff, tighten it at ride height. You can do that with just putting a jack under your suspension and cranking it up a little bit, which is what I'm doing here for the end links. All right, so we're all done with the front. Time to move on to the rear. running out of light and quick. So I'm gonna tighten up the rear ones, 69 foot pounds, get that rear sway bar on, beautiful. All right, all four suspensions are on. So now it's time to roll them fenders. This is our fender roller. Uh, it goes on the hub like so. You can also get pretty far with a hammer. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna start with this and then we'll probably use this to finish up. Kind of just get that fold started. In case you haven't talked to your neighbors in a while, do this and uh, trust me, you'll talk to them. Hammer portion, done. Roller portion, next. Boy, I don't know if this is gonna go short enough. Um, shit. Maybe it'll work on the fronts. Well, our fender roller doesn't fit in the front either. It's just too long for the Miata's tiny wheel wells. So I guess that means we're just doing the whole thing with a hammer, which is honestly fine in my opinion. You can get very good results with the dead blow. That's how I've done it in the past. Uh, I was hoping to be able to show you how that thing worked, but it's very simple. Uh, you'll figure it out if you ever, if you ever get there. Um, maybe we'll be able to use it on something else someday. Anyway, we're just gonna hammer these fenders and uh, get it done with, you know? All right, we're gonna put the old wheels and tires back on. And if you remember from last episode, I forgot to buy hub centering rings but I got some, so in they go. Uh, we'll see how our ride height is. Just kind of took a guess in the dark, so let's find out. Oh shit. Well, uh, I'm pretty sure that's gonna rub. 
That's gonna be close. That's worth a drive to see if that rubs. All right, so upon further review, I don't think we're gonna be able to run our precious little fender liners. Maybe I'll be able to trim them up someday and put them back in, but for now, we're going no fender liners. All right, so right now I'm adjusting the ride height on the car to try to raise the front a little bit. So to do that, all I had to do was break loose the lower collar that locks in place the ride height. You break that loose and then spin the spring perch collar with your wrench like this, and it spins the body in that lower bracket. Because now the lower bracket's mounted, it can't move. So we spin this, and that changes our ride height. Then we'll spin this collar back down, lock it in place, call it a day. All right, so I'm just measuring to see how much I've raised both sides to make sure I do them kind of evenly. Uh, looks like I've got it even, so we're gonna lock these down and see how this looks. Uh, you can also just measure your, uh, the gap from your tire to your fender as well uh, for measuring ride height. But since we have this open, we'll measure it there. No rubbing. That ride height looks pretty good to me. It looks nice and low. Before we go driving, we gotta do a couple tests. First thing you're gonna wanna do is turn the wheel all the way left and all the way right, ideally while rolling a little, to make sure nothing rubs, okay? Nothing rubs. Now, meet me at the end of the driveway for the second test. This one's called the driveway test, and it's whether or not you can still get out of your driveway. This being out is great. Go for a drive, boys and girls. This thing feels great. So on hard bumps, we still have a little bit of rubbing in the rear, so I'm gonna have to roll the rear fenders a little bit more, but otherwise it feels great. It's stiff, it's not too harsh, it's comfortable, but it's not bouncy. So I'm really happy with this. So we lowered it today, which means that we've changed the alignment. So next week, we're gonna figure out how to do a full alignment in the garage. So check me back for that next Wednesday on Money Pit. In the meantime, follow me at Zach Job. Follow Donut at Donut Media, and I'll see you guys next week. Stay safe, wash your hands, and keep your distance. See ya.